Okay. So good afternoon, evening, depending on where everybody's from. I'm Amanda Saunders. I'm Michael Dubé. And I'm Matthew Studley. And together we're going to be going over the techniques for modeling contact networks in a pandemic from the work that we've been a part of for uh, over the last however long this pandemic has been. So we're going to start with an introduction. We're going to go over generative and direct representations of contact networks. Um, we're going to talk about the fitness landscape for graph evolution. We're going to talk about how important patient zero is. And then we're going to present some of the results and talk about uh, some of the software. So starting off at the beginning with an introduction. So before we get started, we need to go over a couple of things that you may or may not have come across, just so that we can all be on a relatively level field to go over some of the things we're going to be getting to later in the presentation. So what is a graph? A graph is a set of vertices and a collection of edges. Edges are unordered pairs from a, a vertex to another vertex. The graph specifies a collection of objects of interest and the neighbor relations are given by the edges. So in this particular case, graphs can be used to represent personal contact networks. In the formulation of nodes and vertices, they can either be people in a community and the edges of the social interactions between the individuals. This is just one way of trying to map out how stuff like a pandemic can spread. A graph is a connected if there is a sequence of vertices and edges that can start at any vertex and end at any other. Graphs that are um, not connected have connected components. We declare that the distance between verti vertices in a connected graph to be the shortest pass path between them a graph, uh, and a, then a graph becomes a metric space. The diameter of a graph is the largest distance between two vertices. The graph that is not connected, the diameter is infinite. Density of a graph is the fraction of the possible edges that are actually present. A graph with low density is said to be sparse. So these are just a bunch of terms that I'm unfortunately going to have to throw at you that are important in graph theory. And these are the ones that are going to be important for the work that we're going to be talking about. So. An adjacency matrix of a graph is a symmetric binary matrix in, uh, indexed by the vertices of a graph. For vertices V and W, the, pos the position in the graph VW and WV are one if there is an edge between V and W and zero otherwise. A graph is sparse if relatively few of its potential edges exist. A good contact network that explains epinetmic are almost always sparse. So if you think about it, if we have even something small, like if we have 15 points, if I draw every single line possible, that's going to be a very highly connected graph, and it means that everybody is in contact with everybody else. That's not a good representation of how things work in a pandemic situation. It's going to be person A interacts with person B who interacts with person C, and that's more of a usual course of contacts. So back to talking about pandemics, there's a couple of different models that can be used to try and model how epidemics progress. One of them is the SIR model, which in which 
individuals can be susceptible, infected, or removed. Basically, this divides the population into th to three groups. Susceptible individuals are those that can catch the disease and haven't done so already. Infected people are the ones that um, currently have the disease. And removed people are people that have had the disease and either and are not able to catch the disease again. A person who has the disease has it exactly for one time period under the assumptions of the SRR model. And each infected person represents a chance for each susceptible person to become an infected person on the next time step. This is assuming that the population is well mixed. Um, that there is going to be a chance alpha of passing the disease from a given infected person to a given susceptible person. And this is maintained as constant throughout the course of the epidemic. One of the main downsides of the SIR our model is that it scales badly. The chances of getting sick in a given time step is beta. So it, it's one minus one minus alpha raised to the power of M if there are currently M infected individuals. If the total number of people is large, the epidemic is virtually certain to infect all susceptible individuals as long as alpha is greater than or equal to the reciprocal of the population size. This dependence of the behavior of an epidemic on the population size rather than an individual contact rate is evidence of bad scaling. Typically, this model is modified by permitting the disease to spread only along a contact network. So we're removing that assumption of the basic SRI model that it's a well-mixed population by restricting the movement of the infection along specific edges within a graph. And then this reduces um, the chance of getting sick to, it restricts it from being the whole population to only uh, the, based on the number of infected neighbors that you have. Now, next little mini like injection of information to make the rest of this make sense. So very quick review of evolutionary computation. Evolutionary computation is an algorithm that uses Darwin's theory of evolution as a starting point. There are many different schools of evolutionary computation. Um, Holland and Goldberg invented genetic algorithms. Lawrence Fogel invented evolutionary programming. Ingo Rentschberg and Hans Paul Schwefel invented evolution strategies. And there are several other flavors. In aggregate, we call these techniques evolutionary algorithms. In general, evolutionary algorithms are best used on problems that you don't understand well yet. These are easy to code, but slow to run. And there are a large number of design choices which permit, but also require, a great deal of tuning of algorithm performance. In order to use evolutionary computing, you must assemble the following. A problem with a well-defined measure of quality for a solution, a data structure that can store solutions to the problem, techniques for bending and modifying these data structures, a technique for choosing solutions with, pro -qual with a pro-quality bias, so a way of selecting the, the better answers, a, tech, a technique for solu uh, choosing solutions to discard, and a criterion to decide when you have found an acceptable answer. Evolutionary computation is an example of a population-based technique. This means that an algorithm operates on a collection or a po population of solutions, using comparison between different population members to direct search.
so just in basic in a pseudocode format, what I'm going to be needing to do is that I need to initialize a population of structures. I need to then assess the quality or you know fitness of each structure. And then I'm going to need to pick parents that are measurably better than the ones that I don't uh, the than some of the other solutions. I'm going to take those parent structures and through some measure generate child structures, evaluate how those child structures perform. From those, I'm going to select the good ones and then replace members of the population with those new and improved children structures. And I'm going to go through that, that process of picking parents, generating children, selecting which ones are good, and replacing old or bad members of the population. And we're just going to continue doing that process until we reach some end point, whether that's a set number of runs, whether we've gotten to a specific target. And there are various techniques for blending two parents together. Um, these are generally called crossover operators. A tech, the techniques for just modifying individuals is, are called mutation operators. And collectively, both of those together are called variation operators. And together, um, uh, and with the, sorry, the quality measure for solutions is generally called a fitness function and picking and discarding is called selection within the algorithm. So there are different kinds of crossover. Um, some of which are were be very familiar with from a biology standpoint. For example, one point crossover is just taking the 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 chromosome from one parent and the chromosome from the other parent and then making a single cut and exchanging pieces. Same with two point crossover, only there's two cuts. We can have uniform crossover where it's broken up into more pieces. And crossover points are typically chosen uniformly at random. And when you're doing uniform cr crossover, you are um, it deciding on each at each loci point which parent's value goes to which child. Uh, the standard application is to optimize real parameters. Suppose that we're fitting this this particular function to a set of data. The data structure will hold an array containing a value for A, a value for B, a value for R, and a value for D. And uh, the fitness in this particular case is going to be an error measure on modeling of the data. And just for this particular example, we're going to select one point crossover, and our mutation operator is going to add a normally distributed random number to each parameter. And then you can see that if I start with a whole bunch of A, B, R, and Ds, when I run that a bunch of times, I'm eventually going to stumble upon a solution that models the data that I was trying to get it to model. Um, one of the other important um, choices when designing on evolutionary algorithm is the population size. This is going to be something that's very important depending on the fitness landscape of the problem. And it's going to actually play a relatively big role sometimes in how you quickly you get to an optimal solution and whether or not certain solutions are even going to be reachable. So, when you're trying to make an evolutionary algorithm work really well, you need to have a good fitness function. This is critical. The representation or data structure, how you're deciding to encode the information you care about is a very vital piece of information. And different representations will behave differently. And that is something to try and keep in mind when you're designing an evolutionary algorithm. 
selections and replacement techniques are very important. Um, the population size can be very important. There are certain test scenarios in which it's critical to have an appropriately sized population and others where the success of the algorithm is less dependent on an appropriately selected population size. Variation operators are usually very important for most problems that you could be applying this technique to and the rate of application to operators, it, it does play a role, but it's generally going to be one of the things that you try and tune later on in the process. And unfortunately, when it comes right down to it, what is a good choice is going to be very problem dependent. Personal performance can be improved by specializing an algorithm to your problem and also, it's very important to try and incorporate expert knowledge whenever you can. For example, some problems find crossover incredibly disruptive. And what it's going to be doing, it's going to be taking your good, your good parents and not being able to reproduce what makes them good. And that it's not going to be very heritable. So those are the kinds of problems that you might run into. And if you are aware that that's one of the problems that you're dealing with, choosing variation operators that are less disruptive is going to be what a way to incorporate that expert knowledge. OK, so when we're dealing with back to this problem, trying to get a representation that we can then apply evolution to. There's going to be two different broad categories for this. I can have a generative representation or a direct representation. We're going to go through the direct representations first. And then we'll talk about the generative representations and then discuss what fitness functions we can use. So there we do run into a problem. It's like, okay, so I want to just start with a whole bunch of random graphs and then test how good they are. Well, well, what kind of random graph? There are three types that we're going to be going over. The power law cluster graph, eridos renyi graphs, and watts strogatz graphs. So um, power law cluster graphs are derived to be scale-free with a power law degree distribution. So it has to do with certain properties of the graph that make it so that it scales well. It can be generated with uh, the network X Python package, and they are based off of Barabasi Albert graphs. Um, so just after each edge addition, there's going to be a probability of adding a second edge between um, neighbors to generate a triangle. So if I'm adding in this edge, there's going to be a probability that I'm going to be adding this edge as well so that it, it generates a little bit of a connected network. The resultant graphs are dependent on the number of nodes, the number of edges I'm using to populate my graph, and the probability of generating a triangle. This is an example of a power law custo graph that we generated for this particular um, tutorial. And as you can see, that it does have some nodes that are have a very high degree, so they have a lot of neighbors. So different type of way of trying to figure out, like, OK, how can I get a random graph? So this one is um, is named after the people who first published the method in 1958 and their names were Paul Erdos and Alfred Renyai. So each edge has an independent but equal probability of being present. And because it's just going through and going, it's like, does this edge exist? Yes, no. Does this edge exist? Yes, no with a set probability. If you're dealing with a very low probability of edges, you're not necessarily going to get a connected graph. Um, the resultant graphs are going to be affected by 
your number of nodes and the edge probability. And this is an example of a graph that we constructed using this particular technique. And if you'll notice, it does look slightly different and that you can see that just at a glance, you're going to suspect that it has different properties when we're going to look as like, okay, well, how does an epidemic progress through this contact network compared to the one that I showed first? And our third type are watts stogatz graph. So what we do is that we start with a regular ring lattice graph with nodes n with k nearest neighbors. So that it has k divided by two nearest neighbors on each side. So basically I have, if I put all of my points in a ring structure, I'm going to draw connections between a point and its nearest neighbors around the circle on each side. So that's my starting point. And then once I have that ring structure, I'm going to add in a certain amount of more um, randomness as to this very regular shape. So for one of those connections, I'm going to have give it the chance to be rewired. So unconnect it from the one that is k divided by two away and then select it uh, to have a connection somewhere else in the graph. And it's just restricted so that it's not going to be an edge that already exists or connect to itself. And the resultant graphs are going to be affected by um, this, the number of nodes, the number of nearest neighbors we've selected, and how often that little disconnect and rewiring occurs. And if you can see, it produces yet another type of very different graph. So the big takeaway from this is that if somebody tells you that they populated something with a random graph, it very much matters which kind of random graph they chose to use. OK, so now we will explore four ways contact networks can be generated using evolutionary algorithms. These are known as generative representations. So the first one is directly evolving the rows or columns of the adjacency matrix, known as the naive representation. Next, we develop some edge editing operations and we use prob uh, operation densities to determine which operations to apply to a starting graph. Then we use those same operations and instead of using the densities, we use bit sprayers to generate which operations to apply to a graph. And lastly, we use bit sprayers once again to directly specify the rows or columns of the adjacency matrix with bit sprayers. Some repetition there. <laughs> so let's get into it. So the naive representation. In this representation, the chromosomes are long strings of ones and zeros, which dictate whether every potential edge in the network is present or not. A probability of every edge being present would be set to generate the initial population. This probability would be low as personal contact networks are sparse graphs. Even with this low probability, crossover rapidly creates networks that are dense. Because of this fact, these representations are not viable to undergo evolution. So that is one example of a generative representation, but the representation doesn't work uh, for the problem that we're trying to apply it to. So what are some that do work? <clears throat> so first, the local FADZEN representation is comprised of a number of edge editing operations which are applied to an initial graph. So a chromosome is comprised of 256 of these operations, they're represented as integers. After being applied to the initial graph, a candidate solution in the form of a personal contact network is generated. These are two of the initial graphs that we use. On the left is the ring graph, and on the right is a graph uh, that was created using a power law cluster graph. <laughs> OK, so what are these operations? So if we have a graph and we have the vertices P, Q, R, and S from the set V, the operations are defined below. First, we have toggle. So if an edge is present, then remove it. And if it isn't present, then add it. Toggle the edge. We also have some local operations. And what they do is they, if you apply an operation to a set of three nodes, it guarantees that those nodes are still close to one another. So either one or two steps away. 
And so local toggle does the same thing. It toggles local edges uh, within the network. Hop. So hop uh, is one of the operations that moves an edge around the network. So if you have P to Q on and Q to R on, uh, then an edge PR is not an E, then remove edge PQ from E and add the edge PR. Add, it adds an edge to the graph. Local add, adds an edge locally. Delete, deletes an edge from a graph. Local delete, deletes an edge locally. Swap, the most complicated one and one of the original edge editing operations. If P, Q, and R, S are the only edges between P, Q, R, and S, then remove P and Q, remove R and S from E, and add P, S, and Q, R to E. And lastly, null, which does nothing. Okay, so what have we outlined? We've, in, we've outlined the initial graph edge editing operations are to be applied to, which operations we could apply to those graphs, and how we transform that initial graph into a candidate solution. Our system has the following parameters, a population size, tournament size, mutation probability slash the number of mutations, the probability of infection alpha, how many mating events there are, the number of edge operations to apply to a graph and which initial graph to use. So lots of parameters, as we said before. So problem, we still need a mechanism to determine which operations comprise the initial population and which operations to choose when a mutation occurs. So we use a user-defined probability distribution, which specifies the probability of each ed editing operation being chosen by the algorithm. This is made of nine floating point values, which sum to one. Each potential probability distribution, in essence, specifies a unique representation from a continuum of potential representations. Therefore, we need a way to select a representative subset of operation densities to sufficiently test the space of all potential densities. In order to do this, we use something known as a point packing. So what the heck is that? Well, the original point packing problem is to place K points into the unit square so as to maximize the smallest distance between any two points. The unique optimal solution for eight points is shown on the right. This problem is considered a recreational mathematics problem and the current state of knowledge is maintained at the following website. Earlier work considered the dual problem. For a space under the Euclidean metric, and a minimum distance delf, del, uh, delta, delta, find the largest possible subset of the space with the specified pairwise minimum distance. This example generalizes this result in a manner that permits the implementation of a rapid bioinformatic clustering algorithm. So to generate the local THADS and edge operation probability densities, a point packing of the parameter space is generated. By setting the minimum allowable distance between points, the following procedure outputs a number of parameter settings used to initialize the algorithm. This is known as Conway's lexicode algorithm. As input is a set of S of points in some order and a minimum distance delta. Output is a subset T of S with minimum distance delta. And how, how is this done? Initialize T to be empty, traverse S in order, Add a point from S to T if its distance from the current members of T is at least delta, and then return T. And that return T is a list of uh, possible densities to use, and then we test all of them because that represents the parameter space well. And so we have a modification on that. What happens if we don't want to use densities? We want to use some other uh, tool to decide what operations to use. So we also looked at using bit sprayers. So rather than using command densities to generate the initial population and determine which operation is chosen when a mutation occurs, we use a bit sprayer or complex string generator to determine which operations to choose. Similar to the previous representation, a string of 256 edge editing operations comprise a chromosome, which are to be applied to initial network. So what the heck is a CSG? 
Well, a CSG is a self-driving automata, and a self-driving automata is a finite state device that reads and emits characters. You can see one on the left. The states are A and B, and the transitions are the arrows, uh, and above and below each arrow are if you receive a zero at the top arrow, then you'd output two ones, and if you received a one, then you'd output a one, etc. It can emit more than one character in response to an input. It acts as a CSG by using its own output as its future input. The zero on the sourceless arrow it initiates generation of the CSG. SDAs have a number of interesting properties. Since they emit one or more characters, they have at least as much output as input and so do specify an infinite string. Most SDAs with, with at least one two character emission that is actually triggered create constructively aperiodic strings. The complexity of the strings generated by the SDA can be controlled in part by increasing the number of states of the automata. Limited research on the logical depth of strings created by SDAs suggests they can be very complicated. Self-driving automata, the origin. Self-driving automata were originally used as a source of in synthetic DNA data for testing bioinformatics algorithms. Use of SDAs permits generation of nearly random DNA with subtly embedded patterns. SDAs were inspired by the Kolatsky sequences. Though the idea of generating the, those sequences audio associatively with a finite state machine is a recent innovation. The example on the previous slide is the original Kolatsky sequence. So how do we measure the complexity of a sequence? Well, we generate a very long initial sequence, count how many times each string that fits in an eight character window occurs, the degree to which this distribution of eight character substrings approaches the uniform distribution is a measure of the complexity of the string. And there's a reference to the uh, init uh, initial uh, Kolokski sequence. So how do we use these? Uh, so the, these bit sprayers, they output a bunch of bits, but that's those bits are integers, but uh, we need to construct bigger integers than one. Uh, and so how do we do that? So the output of the SDA has a, is assembled bit by bit, providing the integers that were used to apply an operation to an initial graph, as was done in the local FADSN generative representation with command densities. This representation is similar to the previous, except that the commands are generated in a potentially highly patterned fashion by the SDA rather than using the densities. And so last but not least, we have the generative representation once again using bit sprayers, but this time we're going to solve the problem that we had in our naive representation, and we're actually going to use the bit sprayers to create adjacency matrices. So using a binary CSG to fill in the adjacency matrix of the graph means that the fraction of edges has a very different distribution than we would attain by simply selecting a probability mu for each edge. Earlier work demonstrated that the average number of neighbors required to match epidemic profiles is near 4.5. During generation of initial populations, the number of edges in a graph was restricted to one to six times the number of vertices which in turn allowed degrees of nodes to range from 2 to 12. When we're initially generating, if we generated a network that violated this constraint, it was thrown out and we started again. During fitness evaluation, graphs violating this constraint were awarded an exceedingly bad fitness that was worse than any potential fitness achieved by any result. Using an SDA to fill the adjacency matrix avoids the problems of the direct binary representation discussed above. And so now we're going to discuss some of the different fitness metrics we use to evaluate networks. First is epidemic duration fitness. So how long did the epidemic last? So we simulate 50 epidemics and we sum the lengths of these 50 epidemics and divide by 50, which gives us the mean length of the epidemic. Thus, the candidate solution is the average number of time steps until there are zero infected individuals within the population. Next is profile matching fitness. So for that, we need epidemic profiles. In our work, we use a total of nine profiles and displayed our two of them. And so on the x-axis is the time step. So the number of days since somebody became infected 
And on the Y axis is the new infections for that day. I'm sure we've all seen plenty of these more than we wanted to over the last two years. And so how do we use these to create a fitness uh, value? Well, we simulate 50 epidemics on a candidate solution. For each of these epidemics, the number of infected individuals at each time step is compared with the expected number of infected individuals according to the profile. This provides 50 sum squared error measurements, which are sorted uh, in an increasing fashion. The fitness of the graph is a linearly weighted sum of these SSE values or sum squared error values and is calculated as that function describes. <clears throat> epidemic spread fitness. 50 epidemics are simulated on the candidate solution. The total number of individuals infected by each epidemic over the entire course is recorded. So how far did it spread into the population? These totals are added together and divided by 50 to provide the average spread of an epidemic on the candidate solution. This is known as the epidemic spread fitness. OK, so now that we have an idea of some generative and direct representations that exist, we're going to take a look at the fitness landscape for evolving graphs. And specifically, I'm going to take you through a problem that um, arose and how we chose to deal with it. OK, so first we're going to talk about what motivated this study to better understand graph space and some of these representations that we use for these contact networks. So we noticed that the initial algorithm uh, used to discover these networks was having trouble striking the balance between exploration and exploitation with a bias towards the latter. Now, this is a bit of a loaded figure and you're not really meant to understand everything uh, right away, but what you should take away from this um, are these two different types of graphs, the power law cluster graphs in yellow and the ring graphs in black. Um, the X's are the initial population and the circles are the evolved population at the end. And this is the investigation that resulted after tireless runs of evolution resulted in very little change to the graphs. Um, what you can see here is you can see that kind of no matter how much evolution we were doing, graphs did not change significantly and had uh, quite a bit of difficulty traversing the space. Now, um, a bunch of questions are probably coming up. Uh, how did we plot these graphs? And that's exactly what we're going to go into and take you down kind of the rabbit hole of exploring uh, how to represent graphs, how to determine uh, what graphs are used. So here, these are two principal components, but uh, I'm actually going to describe in depth the many ways that we could represent uh, these two metric, uh, these two axes. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to improve the exploration capabilities of our optimization and the way we're going to do that is we're going to force exploration of the fitness landscape by trying diverse initializations. Uh, that ensures that the best solutions found are not just local optima. Um, we already have a technology that in essence does this and Michael just talked about it. Uh, it's point packing and so our plan here is to point pack graph space. In order to do that first, we have to better understand graph space. We have to determine some of the ways that we can numerically represent graphs such that we can determine how different they are. So in order to point pack these graphs, we first have to be able to measure the distance between two graphs. Some important information to consider about the graphs here for this specific problem, because graphs come in kind of all flavors, the graphs that we're dealing with are unlabeled. They're strictly dealing with the structure of the network and changing the labels on them really doesn't uh, change the connectivity for our purposes. Graphs must have the same number of nodes to be compared. Uh, this is not entirely true and some of the representations uh, do enable us to compare the distance between graphs uh, that don't have the same number of nodes, but it definitely decreases the clarity um, and is not considered here. Uh, graphs are undirected and unweighted in these examples. Um, this is really just for simplicity's sake. Um, and 
graphs are not disconnected. Um, essentially, a disconnected graph from the perspective of running epidemics kind of uh, causes some issues and causes some of the nodes to kind of not be considered. If the epidemic doesn't start there, it can't ever really get there. Um, it's important to remember that there is no one correct way of doing the, uh, this. In fact, there are many uh, ways to do this and it ultimately depends on your goals. Uh, we explore some of these representations here, but realistically the sky's the limit uh, with respect to how creative you can get. So we'll discuss some of them. Uh, of them, we discuss diffusion characters, page rank value, degree sequence, and summary statistic of degree sequence. Okay, so these are just some of the ways that we can take a graph and turn it into a numerical vector that we can compute a distance on. Okay, so first up is diffusion characters. A diffusion character for a network is computed by releasing a different gas at each node of the network. Acting over time steps, the gas at each node is divided amongst its neighbors, and then half of the gas at each node is removed. Each node then receives a quantity of its specific type of gas. The level of each gas at each node is permitted to come to equ equilibrium, and that's why half of the gas is removed so that eventually the system balances itself out. And what you're left with is some gas from each node that arrives at its final destination node. Now, um, if you're paying attention, you may realize that those diffusion characters would actually form a matrix. Um, and in order to calculate this distance, we would like to turn this into a vector. And so what we use is we use column entropy of the distance. So each of those uh, columns in this matrix is going to be condensed into an entropy value. So diffusion characters are used to compute a distance between networks in the following fashion. The Shannon entropy of the distribution of each gas is computed. These numbers are sorted into descending order and distance between graphs is then estimated by the Euclidean distance between the sorted list of numbers. We note that this is not a true distance because similar but non isomorphic graphs may end up at distance zero. What's very important is that if the diffusion characters are different, then the graph is definitely different. The reason that these numbers are sorted is because the graphs are unlabeled, and so the sorting is a way to logically compare nodes to each other. Uh, the second method is PageRank. PageRank is Google's algorithm for ranking page, uh, pa web pages for online search. It connects web pages together in a network by the linking structure between them. So literally the hyperlinks that you would click to get from uh, page to page. Um, this is the input for PageRank, a network, and similarly we will use a network, and it ranks sites based on the relative traffic that it would receive given the structure of the network. Um, each node's rank is based on a value describing the proportion of traffic it would receive, and naturally the sum of all of the nodes of PageRank's values must equal one. So we've got two of these methods that already describe uh, you know, some condensed connectivity of the graphs that may be useful for um, modeling epidemic spread. Okay, the last unique one that we will describe is degree sequence. So the degree sequence is pretty simple. It's just an ordered sequence of the number of neighbors, uh, the degree of each node. Um, this is somewhat of a skin deep measure, especially when compared to diffusion characters and page rank. Um, as only direct neighbors are used. Um, the upside is that it's very cheap to compute. Now you may notice that we had four that we were going to talk about. Um, degree sequence gives rise to some very interesting representations. Um, this enables a space based on the summary statistics of this sequence, uh, mean, standard deviation, and skew. Um, and these surprisingly simple metrics are actually very efficient for representing graphs. OK, so in order to point pack graphs, uh, we have a couple requirements. First, we need to be able to generate random graphs. Thankfully, Michael has that covered. Secondly, 
we have to represent graphs in a way that permits calculation of distance. We just covered a bunch of ways to do that. Next, we are going to point pack the graphs using Conway, the Conway variation operator, which is very similar to the Conway lexicode algorithm that Michael just described. And the last thing that we're going to do is maximize the size, number of members of the packing while respecting the minimum distance constraint. So um, something to note, point packing is an online process. So it provides an object or a well spaced out population to hand off to the evolutionary algorithm to optimize to match a profile for uh, to match a profile or to match an epidemic length. OK, um, so now again we see another image like this and we have a little bit more context for what these axes are. Um, a slightly different figure is shown here with a couple different flavors of graphs. We see the power law cluster graphs in yellow, the Erdos Renier graphs in red, and the Watts Strogratz graphs in blue. Um, here we also see point packed graphs in green that point pack power law cluster graphs. Um, and these axes are the first two principal components for diffusion characters. Now, what's interesting is that these point packed graphs are actually point packed in page rank space. So you can see that some of them overlap slightly, but what's very interesting is that we can mix and match these representations based on what um, is available to us. So for example, diffusion characters are quite expensive to compute. Um, you kind of have to do this gas diffusion simulation. Um, page rank, on the other hand, is pretty well implemented in many uh, packages like in R and Python. Um, and so it's pretty accessible um, and yet our page rank values, uh, when we're point packing in page rank, we still have well spread out uh, graphs in our diffusion character axis. Um, what point packing here does is it allows for more variability in the same number of initial graphs. So if we were to initialize these uh, evolutionary algorithms with our power law cluster graphs, um, it's difficult to select the same number of graphs and achieve the variability that we get with the point packed power law cluster graphs. Um, still, some of the areas of the space are off limits. Um, this is due to power law cluster graphs being our input graph. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. You can see the area that's um, occupied by Erdos Renier and Watt Strogratz. Um, the reason that these axes are so shifted is actually because the ring graphs are somewhere way off to the right and at the top. Um, and they had trouble evolving, and so they were kind of dropped from uh, our experiments. Uh, so the point packing here used page rank. Diffusion characters are expensive to calculate, and so we can leverage the fact that we have cheaper alternatives um, to uh, perform our optimization using cheap fitness evaluations and then display using our expensive uh, evaluations. OK, now you'll notice that we didn't get uh, a very good spread or maybe as good of a spread uh, as we would have liked to got because we were using our power law cluster graphs. And so instead here we use uh, some bit sprayer graphs and you can see that bit sprayer graphs, um, graphs generated with a bit sprayer can cover uh, a lot more of the space uh, fairly evenly. And the colors here are uh, Erdos Renier graphs of various parameters, and you can see that they are uh, very limited into the area that uh, they can actually take up. Now, this uh, particular set of axes is the mean and standard deviation of degree sequence. Um, when you would typically think about a random graph, probably the first one that would jump into your head would be Erdos Renier. So it's interesting to see, um, you know, just how random those really are. OK, uh, similarly, here are another set of graphs generated with the bit sprayer. Um, this is 10,000 graphs, and you can see that while they cover the space quite well, um, there definitely is some bias towards some areas. And what we can do is we can take this set as our input set and point packet, and we can get the next figure. 
which is this sample point packing. So now you could imagine that if you had to select 36 points from those 10,000, you would be pretty unlikely to select something as well spread out as this. And so using this as a point, as an initial population, gets you as evenly close to any part of the space um, as you can, um, thereby reducing the amount of travel that you would have to do via editing operations to, uh, to reach any part of the space. Okay, um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about connecting these representations. I mean, as you've already noticed, we've been mixing and matching them a lot. And so kind of determining what the relationship is and what the equivalencies are could be very useful for us. So each graph can be represented using any of the representations. And we may want to know which is the most appropriate, what are the trade-offs, and how do these relationships change at different graph sizes? So we may want to know about these rep, uh, relationships, but are these things that are going to hold up as we consider different sizes of networks? And uh, we proposed an experiment to do this. Um, the experiment is fairly simple. We're going to generate a large number of graphs at various sizes. For graphs of each size, we're going to calculate all the pairwise distances for each of the representations that we just talked about. And for each pair of representations, we're going to each pair of representation, we're going to calculate the correlation between the pairwise distances. So how much do these representations agree on their pairwise distances? And we're going to end up with that at a bunch of different sizes, and we're going to model the correlation as graph size changes with a linear model. OK, so the results for this um, are shown here, and what you're seeing are 95 percent confident confidence intervals for the parameters. So the top uh, chart is beta zero, the y-intercept, and the bottom chart is beta one, uh, the estimate of the slope. Now this is an interesting uh, instance where the beta zero is really the value that we care about more, and this is going to be the estimate for the correlation. Now, um, if the correlation doesn't change with size, our slope is going to be equal to zero, and our beta zero, or the y-intercept, is going to give a baseline estimate for the correlation. So um, the ones that are of particular interest here are that the pairwise distances between using diffusion characters are actually highly correlated with the pairwise distances in our mean and standard deviation of degree sequence. Uh, space. So this is a two coordinate system that uses the mean of the degree sequence and the standard deviation of the degree sequence. Um, what's really cool about this is that it actually condenses it down to a two coordinate system. Diffusion characters, page rank, and degree sequence are all, um, they all output a vector that's based on the number of nodes that you have. So this is independent and technically can be used to do a distance between graphs of different sizes. Um, it's also, it also has really good scaling because on top of not having to simulate all of the diffusion characters, you actually don't even have to order the uh, degree sequence. So the other important takeaway here is that page rank is pretty highly correlated with the skew of the degree sequence. That's its uh, highest correlation. And it is significantly different from any of the other representations or uh, relationships. Um, as for the estimates with, uh, for slope, uh, cells that uh, contain a zero here indicate the confidence interval contained zero, which means the slope is plausibly zero. Um, what that indicates is that we don't expect the correlation to change as the size of the graph changes. Um, which is good news. However, for our relationship between diffusion characters and mean standard deviation space, along with a couple of other um, ones, we do see that we have a slightly negative slope. This indicates that it's possible that the relationship decays uh, at large graph sizes. So again, just to quickly summarize, diffusion characters are most similar to mean standard deviation. Uh, this is immensely less computationally expensive to calculate and remove some of the scaling on the size of the graph. Page rank is the most similar to skew of degree sequence, and most of these relationships do not change as the size of the graph changes. However, 
The slope for the correlation between diffusion characters and mean standard deviation indicates that this re relationship may decay around 10,000 nodes. However, the data set for this is nowhere near 10,000 nodes. In fact, I think it tops out at around 650 nodes. Um, so this is a large extrapolation and should be taken with a grain of salt. I would say if you have very large graphs and you want to leverage this, that I would reassess. Um, some of the conclusions or takeaways from point packing graphs. Uh, point packing graphs allows for greater variability to be, to be achieved at the same sample size. Um, the benefit of this is most notable when the fitness function is very expensive, as exploration can be offloaded to an online process. So our fitness function for assessing these is actually running epidemic simulation, which is very, very uh, cost prohibitive. However, what we're doing is we're e equitably sampling the space with no requirement to run any of these simula simulations. This provides the opportunity to point pack with computationally inexpensive representations and refine with more expensive ones. So like you saw in the beginning, uh, we could point pack with page rank and refine with diffusion characters if we so chose. Um, we kind of discovered that mean standard deviation space is very similar to uh, diffusion characters, and so you can kind of get the best of the both of both worlds with that one. Um, initialization with a point packing does not necessarily result in higher fitness, but it instills more confidence that a global optima has been found rather than just a local one. What we're just doing is just guaranteeing that all different types of networks can be found and assessed um, instead of kind of just locked into one area. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that those new areas that are being explored are better. Uh, it just gives us confidence that we've tried uh, a lot of different stuff. Okay, um, on that note, now we're going to take a look at another important aspect, and this is particularly when simulate, uh, simu simulating epidemics. Um, there's some important to who the patient zero is. Because we're using unlabeled graphs, this is something that actually became more complex as we, look at it, as we looked at it. So, how does a starting node impact epidemic progression? Um, to test this, we're going to compare outcomes of epidemic simulation on various networks using all possible individuals as patient zero. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to point pack graphs. Uh, that's going to start us with a diverse collection of graphs to do this assessment on. We're going to simulate epidemics many times for each possible starting node within each graph, and we're going to quantify similarity to an epidemic profile. Um, the results of this use a model that is much more complex than SIR. Um, it's called SEE prime AIR. It allows for asymptomatic individuals. It allows for transmission prior to showing symptoms. And it has those states. It has an additional state E, which is exposed. It's a point where you're exposed to the virus, but you are not able to transmit it. Um, there's a state E prime where you're exposed contagious but not symptomatic. Um, it has the additional state asymptomatic as well, which allows for people who are infected to never show symptoms. Um, this is something that we feel more accurate, accurately represents some of the nuances that were gradually uh, presented during the pandemic and um, kind of captures a little bit more of the story in terms of case numbers. We know that case numbers are not a be all end all absolute correct value of all infected individuals. Some people don't report, some people never show symptoms, um, and those aren't just the people that are necessarily spreading it. Okay, so we're trying to model this a little bit more accurately and that comes with a lot of complexities. This has some complications with profile matching that come from simulation. More states require more time steps for epidemics to ramp up. And this is accounted for by allowing some burn in. So we take a look at some of these patient zero impacts and we also take a look at some of the impacts of burn in. Here is a um, model of this SEEAIR uh, model. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, it has these transition states shown. Uh, the probabilities are based on the time that it takes in days. 
um, as per what was released. Here is a collection of bits brayer uh, point packed graphs. Um, what's shown is the variability of average epidemic profile matching across all of the patient zeros. So we can see that most of the graphs kind of hover in that just above 4.5 range. They have some amount of variability and we can see that some graphs match the profile a little bit better and have a lot of variability based on who the patient zero is. Uh, we see that some of them actually match it pretty well and have small variability. And we see that there's one graph that seems like it performs quite badly, graph 19. Um, and if we want to take a look at these with burn in, we can see that our graph that performed poorly does even worse. Um, and we see that for the most part, pretty similar. Some of them seem to have reduced uh, the variability a little bit, condensed their kind of uh, their box plot. A little bit of shrinking going on. OK, so we're going to take a look at a couple of these in turn. We're going to take a look at from this image uh, 2, 11 and 19. OK, so we've got one that is you know, has some good stuff and also has some worse stuff. Um, this one is an instance of a graph that really matters who uh, you pick as patient zero. So what we have is we have 100 epidemics simulated with each possible patient zero, and these are the median ranked nodes. So you're going to kind of see this ascending box plot, set of box plots every time. Um, this indicates that in this network, there are a couple starting nodes that match the profile significantly better. Um, you know, you can pick kind of those top three or four and get some pretty good consistency at some pretty good uh, profile matching. Whereas most of the nodes perform badly and some perform quite badly. OK, so this is an instance where picking the patient zero matters a lot. Um, and with burn in, we can just see that this variability is reduced. OK, so a lot more of them seem uh, viable as patient zero. Um, if we go on to the next one here, you'll notice that the numbering for the graphs is off and I apologize because of inconsistent indexing, um, but that shouldn't. I think you should be able to get past it. Um, here, this is an instance where the patient zero doesn't really matter. Most of the nodes perform very similarly. Um, and with burn in, just reduced variability, or at least more consistent variability. Um, so this is an instance again where it doesn't really matter necessarily what patient zero you pick. And what this is going to be indicative of is a very regular graph. The graph looks the same from each individual's perspective in terms of connectivity. Um, and so it doesn't really matter who you pick. This is also a graph that seems well suited to match the profile in question. This is uh, the the graph that was particularly bad had a very difficult time matching the profile. Um, and it's it might be a little bit hard to notice, but the axis is actually completely different. With burn in, this one actually gets even worse. The axis scales even higher. Um, and what this means is this probably means that this ep this contact network causes the epidemic to ramp up too quickly and burn in just exacerbates that uh, fact, causing it to kind of be totally out of sync with the profile. OK, so the takeaways here, um, in reality, there's always some difference in the epidemic progression depending on who patient zero is. Um, this is solely based on the likelihood of getting a perfectly regular graph. It's low, um, and that in combination with the uh, variability from simulation. Um, it's very unlikely. Some graphs experience this phenomenon uh, a lot more than others, how important patient zero is. Uh, Burn-in reduces the variability of simulation slightly, 
Um, not all networks improved with burn in, but this is likely profile dependent. Additionally, none of these networks are optimized yet for these profiles. So all of these networks would undergo, undergo um, editing operations to improve their profile matching capabilities. OK, thank you, Matt. Uh, so now we are going to go over some of the different results we've obtained with a bunch of the work we've done over the last uh, three or four years. Uh, so what we're going to go through is uh, what happens when you add subcommunities or districts to a network. Uh, we're going to directly compare the three representations that we, the three generative representations that we outlined above. And we're going to look at some different epidemic models. So the SIRS, SIIR, and SIVR, which I will explain. And what happens if you add weighted edges to a contact network? How's that impact results? And last but not least, investigating the impact of simple vaccination strategies. Okay, so in subcommunities or districts, the overall population is comprised of K smaller districts. Each district has an identical size and structure. All the districts are considered neighbors to the other districts comprising the population. And in a district without infected individuals has a probability alpha prime of five or 10%, that one of its members will become infected by each neighboring infected district, and that's calculated independently. So how do we comprise these? Well, you take a personal contact network on the left, copy it, uh, and then let's say you're doing it with four districts, you place them around and then do a complete graph of all those connected to each other. Blue lines represent uh, alpha probabilities of the infection spreading between individuals and dotted green lines, alpha prime probability of it jumping between networks. These are the different communities that we compare. So we have at the bottom the original network with 128 vertices, and then we ramp that up to 512. So uh, a community with 512 and no districts, A. B and C both have four districts of 128 nodes each for a full total of 512. D and E eight no eight sorry D and E have eight districts with 64 nodes each, and once again we're investigating the two values of A prime. So what do we see on the left within each uh, rectangle, which each rectangle there's eight rectangles and that represents the eight parameter studies used to specify edge densities. Uh, and so on the left of each is the original results for epidemic profile or sorry epidemic duration fitness so a higher value is preferred um and so uh yeah furthest left is the original results uh for a community with 512 nodes uh in black there we see that that outperforms all the other potential versions so that's without the districts then uh, when we have four districts, so that's red and orange, they hover around each other and they're different based on the alpha prime value. So it looks like a lower alpha prime value is preferred. And then last but not least, D and E, where we have eight districts with 64 nodes, are blue and green. And we see that the blue ones uh, outperform uh, our baseline there in all the cases. Uh, whereas if you lower that alpha prime value to point uh, to 5%, uh, that it does outperform the baseline, but only slightly and nothing in comparison to the other communities. These are some of the networks generated. So this is one district's 128 nodes. Uh, networks that look like this, we call them banana shaped because you have the patient zero at one end and it spreads slowly across the banana. And this is one way to cause uh, a longer infection to a uh, longer epidemic to occur is you have to make it slowly burn across the community. Uh, if we bump it up to four districts with 128 nodes, we see that a significant portion of the ring structure from which we started uh, is retained. But uh, if we look at the difference in alpha prime values, once we lower it, uh, we see that actually less of the ring is maintained and more of it becomes that banana shape. So that alpha prime value definitely has some impact on how much of the original network is maintained. Next, we're going to look at comparing the results from the different genitive representations and to do so, we're going to use two epidemic profiles known as the unimodal and bimodal profile, which has one hump and two hump or outbreaks. Uh, so first, comparing the local THADS-N using densities with that of bit sprayers. Uh, 
On the left of both of these graphs, representing the two different profiles being used, is the baseline. And this is for profile matching fitness, so a lower value is preferred. And we can see that uh, if you look at the ring baseline compared to the bit sprayers, uh, it clearly outperforms every single parameter setting used. Uh, and then when we look at the power lock cluster graph baseline on the unimodal profile, it's, outperform it's outperformed by the baseline once again, uh, regardless of parameter setting. Uh, but then on the bimodal, it uh, does about the same, but the power, uh, power lock cluster baseline um, has more variation than uh, the bit sprayers. Uh, so maybe bit sprayers to specify uh, edge editing operations is not a good idea based on these results. Uh, but we use bit sprayers also to specify adjacency matrix. So how did those do? Well, if we look at the top there on the Unimoto pro, uh, profile, we see that uh, the baseline on average did do better than any of the parameter settings. Though we also notice that uh, some of the parameter settings found outliers that were better than any of the outcomes from the baseline. So there is some potential there to maybe do some more tweaking on that profile in particular. Um, but then if we look at the bimodal profile, the baseline did far worse than every single parameter setting. So on that profile, the adjacency matrix was definitely the obvious choice uh, to use because regardless of parameter setting, it performs much better and has less variation. And so where do these graphs fall in graph space? Um, so shown are the nonlinear projections of the sorted entropy distance vectors for the CSG experiments using the representations described. The baseline outcomes are in green squares. Uh, the SDA command, dent, uh, sorry, the SDA used to specify operations or edge editing operations are in red and the adjacency matrix in uh, orange. And so as you can see, the adjacency matrix representation is able to do a much better exploration of the space than either uh, the baseline or the SDA command type. So there might be a flaw in editing uh, in representations in which we take an initial graph and make some modifications to it because the adjacency matrix is blowing it all out of the water. <laughs> and so now we're going to look at some different models of infection and see how that impacts it. So first we have the SIR versus the SIRS. The SIR mo SIRS model means that once you become removed after a certain number of days, you're able to become infected again. So you move back to the susceptible state. Uh, and so you obviously as a parameter have to specify how long that'll take. So we have six, eight and 10 days. And so what does that do to the results for epidemic duration? Well, in purple at the bottom, we have our baseline, uh, which is obviously under every single implementation of a SIRS, which is not that surprising. If you allow people to get sick a second time, obviously the epidemic's going to last longer, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, and let's see, what about that parameter in which we have different uh, times between when you can, can become susceptible again? So the lower that value, the better results we get, as you can see in red, having sometimes uh, eight times the original baseline values. Uh, and then in orange, you have the SIRS 8 and in green, SIRS 10. So next, let's look at the SIIR model. So the modification here means that individuals can uh, remain infected, not can, they do remain infected for two days. So that means instead of after getting sick and passing it on to their neighbors, the following day, whatever neighbors didn't get it can now get it. Um, and so we have four of the profiles displayed here. What you can see is that for the most part, uh, the fitness uh, achieved under both models is very similar. So evolution was able to take that into account uh, with all the confidence intervals overlapping. Uh, there's not one where it doesn't, um, but you do see that sometimes the different models uh, cause different levels of variability within the, um, uh, depending on the model. And so these are some of the networks generated. Once again, there are minor variations between the two, but for the most part, they look rather similar. 
Uh, there might be where in one of them it's the green dots that are in a, in a location and the other one it's the yellow, but for the most part there's not anything obviously that different or, or standing out. So here is one of those examples where you have a, a loop with the blue and orange, whereas the loop that reta is retained is with the yellow and orange on the other side. And this one as well. Okay, last we have here is we have the original pro, uh, epidemic profile in blue. And what we compare is we say, okay, let's let's evolve using the one model. So in orange and blue, or sorry, orange and green, we evolve using the SIR model. And then we unleash the two different versions of an epidemic on that evolved graph. And so what we find is that uh, the outcome is actually more a product of how it was evolved rather than what is actually applied to it at the end of evolution. So you have the orange and the green uh, very close to each other, some minor differences, but very good at uh, going close to the original profile. And then we have the red and purple, which were uh, evolved under the SIIR model. And there is a, a bit of a jump in the red one to the right. So when it uh, undergoes the SIIR, SIR epidemic under the SIR model, it takes a bit longer to get to the hump because people are sick for one day instead of two. Uh, and then, but both of them, they far overshoot the hump. Uh, it's not close to it, obviously, as you can see. Okay, what about an SIVR model? And so in this model, you have a partial vaccination that represents partial immunity to a virus. So each susceptible node has a 20% chance of becoming partially vaccinated each time step. Additionally, for each infected neighbor, the node had a 50% chance of becoming infected, whereas vaccinated nodes had a 30% chance of becoming infected. Vaccinations were preferred to infections should an individual be considered for both. And at the bottom here, we have furthest to the left, the SIR model under parameter setting one, which in this case was the best uh, performing parameter set. And this is for epidemic duration, so a higher value is preferred. And as you can see, obviously, once you implement some sort of vaccination uh, across the board, regardless of parameter setting, our results are better. The duration goes down. Um, and all the parameter settings for that duration going down do overlap lap significantly, so it's more a product of the vaccination step rather than a particular parameter setting performing well. Though if you look at parameter setting five, it has a very low variance with most of the um, uh, results being uh, lower than the medians of all the other uh, parameter settings. So these are some of the generated networks. Uh, if you look at the top one there, you can see more of the original ring is maintained within the network uh, and there's more sort of fluctuation in the bottom network there for the vaccinated version. So now epidemics with vaccination strategies. So this uh, paper that we had done was looking into what is the impact of different vaccination strategies on the outcome. And so we used four, well, three kind of, because no vaccine is a vaccination strategy of not vaccinating. Uh, random vaccination, which is at each time step, one individual from the susceptible category is uniformly at random selected for vaccination. High degree means that we take all the nodes with the highest degree and from them randomly select one of them to vaccinate. And ring, where we take every infected individual look at everybody they come into contact with and inoculate one of those people. <clears throat> okay, so what is our outcome? So first we have different environments. So a static environment means that we do all the evolution of a network and then after it's been evolved, we then apply a normal epidemic and an epidemic with vaccination to it and see what the results are. So in this case, you can see that when there's no vaccination, uh, the duration of the epidemic is much, much longer, uh, about three times as long. Uh, and then at the bottom there, with significant amounts of overlap, you see the effect of the different vaccination strategies. So it seems on average, the random vaccination, it performs worse. The random high degree vaccination generally performs in about the middle. And the best is the ring vaccination. And as you can see in, it, in parameter settings 5, 10, and 17, it uh, is blowing the other ones out of the water. 
<clears throat> so ring vaccination seems to be uh, a good choice here. And so what about epidemic spread? Once again, epidemic spread is a measure of how uh, many people within the uh, population got sick over the course of an epidemic. And so at the top there, you can see when there's no vaccination, it's typically able to get everybody infected. Whereas if we have random vaccination or uh, uh, if we have random vaccination or random high degree vaccination, there's not that much variation. And for the most part, they're close. But there are times when a random high degree vaccination does outperform uh, random vaccination. And then if we look at ring vaccination, uh, oddly enough, a lot of the times it's actually worse uh, than all the other strategies. And as you can see as well, there's lots of variation in the outcome. <laughs> okay, so now in an evolving environment, what that means is we uh, unleash an epidemic and, and that's how we're calculating fitness as we've discussed before. And Throughout evolution, there is vaccination. So that means that the, the epidemic is able to evolve and say, okay, cool, I'm getting vaccinated. How do I beat it? Um, and so in this case, you can see here in red, once again, is no vaccination. The first thing we obviously see though is uh, under a static environment, big difference. But once the epidemic's allowed to adapt to your vaccination strategies, not as big a difference. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, once again, though, no vaccination is still obviously worse. <clears throat> but in this case, uh, we see that the ring vaccination actually isn't the preferred choice. In the static environment, it was. In the involving environment, it isn't. Uh, and the random uh, versions of vaccinations typically uh, mirror each other. Um, but there are times when the one or the other is the preferred strategy. <clears throat> And so what about epidemic spread in an involving environment? Uh, with Once again, with no vaccination, we're able to infect everyone. Uh, with ring vaccination, definitely performs far worse than the random strategies uh, and the random strategies there at the bottom, more or less mirror each other. Sometimes one's preferred to the other, but when that is, it's normally random high degree vaccination. Okay, and now edge weights. So one of the other things we did is, well, in, in all our previous research, we had alpha B50, and that was the chance of an infection jumping along an edge. But we said, okay, what happens if we can change the chance of, let's say, uh, someone infecting another person, right? Because you obviously don't socially interact with everyone the same amount. Someone you live with, you're obviously much more likely to infect than someone who you run into at the grocery store. And so we have three different edge weights represented. The gray is our original alpha of 50%. Blue is a, it, it becomes a alpha of 75%. And red is 87.5% chance of that infection jumping. And so what are our results? Well, here uh, within each rectangle, which are different parameter settings, we have on the left uh, an unweighted results, which means everyone has a degree of one. Uh, then we have uh, a degree that's allowed to, uh, sorry, not a different, other than degree, a weight, a weight that starts off at one, but it's able to grow up to that red weight here. Uh, and then in the, in the third one within each uh, rectangle is all edges within the network start at uh, red and they're able to go down. <clears throat> and so what we find is, is when you allow for uh, edge weights and starting at edge weights of three, it far outperforms all the other versions. So starting with every edge being a red edge with an 87.5% probability of infection causes a much longer epidemic <clears throat> in this case. As you can see, definitely in one, two, three, six, and eight. And so we did uh, several more experiments and we see that the same thing is there. So once again, within each rectangle, uh, the third one is the one where we start at edge weights three and generally outperforms, although there are exceptions. So if you look at parameter setting 31, 34, or 35, uh, the uh, three edge weights initial actually does worse than the other ones. And so let's look at, these are first the worst networks that were achieved using uh, the edge weights. And so this is unweighted with 267 edges total. Weighted with an initial weight of one has 276 edges and it was only able to find one edge with a uh, 
weight of two, which is blue right there. And weighted with the initial weight of three, had 478 edges. 256 of them were actually weight one, which means they actually, all of those individually decreased uh, 91 of weight two and 131 of them remaining weight three. And so what about our best results? Uh, we didn't choose for penguins or different shapes. We just chose the best and they happen to be penguins. So this is unweighted, uh, has 344 edges. And so if you compare that, you see 267 to 344, you're, you actually end up with uh, obviously a bunch more edges in this one. Uh, and then uh, unweighted with initial weight of one and 326 edges, 256 of weight one, 61 of weight two, and nine of weight three. <clears throat> and then a horse. Uh, so this is weighted with an initial weight of three and 263 edges with 251 of them retaining the edge weight of three, but obviously very close to the initial ring network. Okay, and so those were all our results and we have uh, one other thing to show you that's a bit more interactive and then we will take questions. And so what we did to demonstrate some of the stuff is we actually made a GitHub repository, which we encourage you all to go actually get you working now. Uh, we're here to help. Um, but basically it allows you to, uh, with a GUI, uh, generate a network and then actually see the network spread through the, um, see, see the epidemic spread through the network uh, and use some of the different random generations we used here. It unfortunately doesn't have the generative representations. That would be a much more uh, time and intensive process to get all of that into one package, as I think we've had maybe a dozen people work on this project, all with their own versions of it implemented on their machine uh, where they're investigating different angles of it. So uh, I will actually pull that up now and just do a um, quick demonstration. If I can get rid of this pop-up thing. Uh, there, it's gone. And so if anyone does have any um, questions, they can start just thinking of them or writing them in the chat and we will get to them as soon as we're done displaying this. <clears throat> It does take a moment to get going because what it actually does at first is it actually generates a graph and simulates a bunch of epidemics and creates all the graphics beforehand uh, so that it's ready to go when you uh, use it. So here it's just randomly generating a graph which just literally says, OK, uh, just add nodes up to the specified number of nodes and do that by randomly selecting edges or sorry, nodes to add the edges to. And so uh, as I said, it's all pre-rendered, so you can say, okay, if that's not a very interesting example, in this case, it died out in one day. So let's generate a new network. Come on, you got this. There we go. Uh, okay, so here we have now patient zero here. And so the next day it infected uh, three of its neighbors and the day after that it infected six, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can actually see how a potential epidemic might spread through the um, population. And so one of the other things we got here is you can specify the number of nodes and the number of edges. So uh, we won't go into that right now, but you can also change the patient zero. So let's say on this same network, let's say 45 was the patient zero. And we go to the next day. Well, there's a 50% chance that it's just gonna die out because 45 is only talking to seven, right? And so let's just now use some of our different random things here. So let's say we generated a new power law cluster network as our initial uh, graph. 
OK, so obviously a very different network from the Powerlog cluster. There's some nodes that have uh, a lot of connectivity there. And so we can see how that spreads. So four people, boom, boom, spreads very quickly through the network. That's seven days, I believe, eight days. And the other thing that's cool is we can actually say, OK, what would happen if we simulated 50 epidemics on this? So we can click this button here. And what we get is we get a uh, epidemic profile. So each of those gray lines are different, uh, are the different simulated epidemics and what ended up happening as it spread through the uh, community. Uh, and then orange line is the average for all of those gray lines, regardless of where they are. And then blue line is the average for epidemics that we're still running. So you'll see in, let's say we switch to uh, an ER graph. And we simulate 50 epidemics. Uh, I guess it's pretty similar, unfortunately. But let's actually, uh, if we change this up to, let's go to uh, Watt Stogatz. And we simulate 50 epidemics. We see that there is a big difference. So once again, the blue is the ones that are still running, only considering the ones still running, and orange is actually, if you consider all the ones that have died out by now, what's the average people that got infected that day? Uh, and the other cool thing you can do here is, so let's go back to a random network. And let's say we change the nodes to 100. Then it's very likely that uh, that it's more likely to die out uh, as compared to the other one because there's a lot less connectivity on the graph. And you can actually see that here is that there's a lot of strings of like, OK, if it were to die out at eight, then this entire section of the network is not going to become infected. Same thing over here. So definitely uh, download that tool. It also, uh, if you wanted to specify things using edge lists, you can also just directly input that here. You would have to do some modifications to the code, but it's pretty uh, user friendly. Unfortunately, not documented. It was made specifically for this tutorial. Um, but uh, but yeah, and uh, we'd all be happy to answer any questions via email if you have about it. But this code will not be being maintained as of yet. Maybe in the future one of us will be like yeah let's just keep that going and add to that um, but as of right now it's just as is and you can free to use it and, and access it from the github so i will pull the talk back up and we would be first one last slide so we'd like to thank uh the national science and engineering research council of canada and the university of guelph for support for this work and at this time we'd be happy to answer any questions Are there any questions for the speakers, please? I think we are on the third day, third session, last session for the conference. So if everybody is tired and exhausted <laughs> and we had so much other things uh, sort to be sorted out. Any, any, anyone, any questions? Oh, we did have a question. Um, unfortunately, trying to come up with a model that is complex enough to generate, um, to cover all of the different possibilities is, is very difficult. And then you run into every time we change the model, then, okay, well, how is that going to be interacting with the types of graphs that we're using? It unfortunately wasn't something that we were able to get to, and it was one of those, we were still trying to understand the model that covered 
the you know that allowed for asymptomatic individuals and for the different you know e versus e prime and how that interacts with the graphs and that it became a just running to try and cover all of those potential options we just kind of couldn't keep up with it and it, there's a lot of future work to be done in this area indeed <clears throat> I, get, I think the other thing off of that is I don't know if because it was are you talking about the variance of the model or we're off? Uh, OK, I guess you are. But we're also right now we haven't uh, gotten it going yet or gotten it published, um, but we're actually looking at a way to use bit sprayers to represent uh, the virus. And so have that represent some sort of genetic code and then have individuals within the community build up immunity to the virus and based on their immunity level compared to the difference between what virus, what variant of the virus they come into contact with, that would determine how likely they are to spread it and how likely they are to become infected. Um, so we're definitely very excited for that because uh, obviously variants are kind of where we're at with COVID. Um, so we think that'll be an interesting area of research. So definitely stay tuned to our research team. Any other questions from anyone? OK, in that case, please join me in thanking these three speakers. It has been a wonderful session, and I think they're all accessible via emails if you have any questions anytime, and they can respond to your queries anytime you like. There are still uh, three people typing, so I don't know if. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah, let's read. Three people typing. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Again, there are so many variables because biological so systems are very complicated, mm -hmm. and really, it comes down to trying to get a model that covers enough of the reality that it gives us something tangible that we can then apply. For example, like vaccine strategies. I can speak to that a little bit if uh, if we're kind of waiting for people to type. But uh, if you go to slide 61, Michael, the formulation for the SEE prime AIR model, which is quite complex, does is based on data released from the original um, SARS-CoV-2, so not the Delta variant or anything like that, but um, this infectious number can be modified. Any of these days can be modified and use this. Uh, you can just use this formula here. One minus uh, E to the power of negative one over days. So um, yeah, if, if, if that data becomes available, then that can be used to modify this model uh, for whichever variant um, arises. Fingers crossed. No more. And so also off of that, what's interesting is that uh, sort of some of the evolution, so the generative stuff was being done concurrently with Matt's work. And so we haven't even had the opportunity to, to turn that patient zero information uh, and uh, initial population information into uh, and apply that to the generative representation. So there's definitely lots of future directions there. So thank you, Matt, for those contributions. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. So thank you for the nice presentation and thank you speakers. I think it is like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in your place and I appreciate you <laughs> getting up and keeping awake and doing the presentation. Wonderful thing. Our next session will start in about 15 minutes time, the panel discussion and we were struggling uh, going around trying to get the panelists available and uh, yeah, we have got all the three panelists now for the session. So in case uh, people have can join, that will be really appreciated. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. It's been us. our pleasure. I know the three of us uh, enjoy this conference all the time, so we're happy to be here. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>
all good then so we join again at